Dr. Sarah Wayland, who um, graduated 2015. Sarah, is that right? That's right. Um, and Sarah's supervisor was Professor Miss Maple, who's in the room as well today. Um, Sarah's going to share her experience with us around um, the three minute thesis competition and we really appreciate you doing this for us, Sarah. So I'll let you get started. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm missing being in Armadale. It was like my second home while I was doing my PhD. So um, it's nice to be chatting here today. And hello to Tanya in the audience, my PhD buddy. Tanya, make yourself known. Hello. <laughs> and Scott, I feel like it's like, um, you know, romper room when they go, I can see. <laughs> Showing my age. Okay. Um, so Cheryl, Cheryl is going to jump through my slides this morning. I only have four slides because nobody wants to have death by PowerPoint. <laughs> is, Cheryl, is Cheryl quietly? <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Is Cheryl quietly shitting herself is what I was going to say, but um, yeah. Okay, okay. What day are we up to Friday? We're up to Friday. Wayland. Wayland is me. And, and, you. and I will just go next slide every time I go to say something, just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, it's really great to be invited to speak here this morning. Um, if you can't hear me at any stage or you've got a question, because you're only like this small on my screen, just make sure that you wave your arms like this and then I'll know that I should stop talking. Um, so I'm going to talk this morning about um, a couple of things, um, primarily the reasons why I think it's important for the School of Health to represent uh, UNE um, in the three minute thesis competition. And that's both me thinking about what I got from the process, um, what my, I think my supervisors got from the process. I can probably already see Miff going, what she going to say? But I promise I will say <laughs> only good things. Um, but also um, broadly in terms of your career, um, what the benefits are of, um, of being involved in the three minute thesis competition. Um, so I've used one of my favourite quotes um, to start off the PowerPoint slides, and it's something that um, Brene Brown talks a lot about. I think it's a, it's somebody else's quote, but I can't actually remember it, so I won't reference it incorrectly like a good PhD student. But it's about the whole idea of stepping into the arena. And I think that the three minute thesis allows us to press pause on the work that we're doing, on the research that we're doing and to think about how we might apply those learnings to the broader community. Um, so like um, what was said at the, I think that, was that Jackie that introduced me because I couldn't oh, see yes. the person? <laughs> yes, it was, Sarah. Excellent, that's all right. Um, so what Jackie said um, was correct, that I was the last participant who um, represented the School of Health in the broader um, UNE competition for three minute thesis. And that was back in 2014. Um, it actually only feels like a couple of months ago, so I'm not quite sure where almost the last three years have gone. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is why it's a good idea. Um, so Cheryl, if you can jump forward with a slide. Um, just a little bit of um, background about who I am and also about um, um, how um, it will explain a little bit further on in my talk about why it's important to do the three minute thesis competition. Um, so I've been a social worker. Um, Miff and I both did our undergrad degrees together um, a number of decades ago. Um, um, and so I've worked as a social worker for uh, about 15 years working in the trauma sector. So responding to families of missing people primarily and managing trauma services. And I decided um, probably about seven years ago when I was pregnant with my last child, that I wanted to start thinking about doing some research because um, as many of us would know coming from the practitioner sector to the research sector is that there's a lot of professional curiosities around the work that we do and there's not much time to press pause and to think about those research questions that could be answered through doing some research. Uh, so I started my, I, I actually started in the master's program and then upgraded to PhD. So that was back in 2012, I think, if memory serves. And then I graduated in uh, 2015. Um, so I was an off campus student. So um, did someone just have a question or were they stretching? Stretching. Yeah. Stretching. Okay, not a problem. Um, so I was an off campus student. Um, I'm based in Sydney. 
Uh, and I used to come up to UNE not just for uh, HDR conferences, but also for um, to teach in the School of Social Work, which I've been doing for a long time. And I'm now working as a postdoc research fellow um, in a part time position. So any people with caring responsibilities or any of those sorts of things, those positions do exist out there in the community. <laughs> so I'm now working at UTS in what used to be called the Faculty of Health, which is now the Australian Centre for Population and Public Health. I'm working there as a postdoc research fellow. Um, so Miff Maple was my primary supervisor and Dr. Cathy Mackay, who's no longer with UNE, but who's now um, in London um, working as a researcher over there. So Cheryl, if you can jump forward to my next slide, um, I'm going to talk less about myself and more about why it is that I think it's important to take um, part in the So project. this is actually a picture from a favourite book that I've always read my kids, uh, Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who. And I talked at the HDR dinner after I finished my PhD about how our research interests are like a little speck on a little piece of clover that we dedicate years and years to trying to understand these concepts. And so I can clearly remember Miff emailing me, forwarding me the email about taking part in the three minute thesis competition. And at that stage, I was part of a group of four of us who were finishing our PhDs together. Um, and we were um, a group who would support each other. Every Wednesday night, we would talk on Skype about how our PhDs were going, whether or not Miff was replying to our emails. <laughs> and, and we'd cook dinner together on Skype um, for our families and talk about how we were going with our studies. So in that group, um, that, that's where the three minute thesis email came from about, it would be really good if you took part so at that stage, I was about nine months out from um, completing my thesis. And as most of you would know, when you get to that stage, you're a little bit exhausted. You're a little bit over your study. You're kind of sick of talking about it, but almost not quite sure what exactly you're talking about at the same stage. So I was probably about 60,000 words into the writing phase. Um, I was really tired emotionally and physically. And um, my initial response to Miff was, um, please go away when she sent that email. <laughs> but you know what I thought, um, you know, this might be a really good opportunity to work out what it is that I've actually studied and how I might present that to other people. If you're thinking about it from a HR perspective, every training course we go to is talking about, well, what's your elevator pitch? You know, as a researcher, you have to be able to capture really quickly what it is that you've done why you've done it, how you've done it, and the so what of what you've actually done. So I thought, you know what, rather than taking this as another thing that I have to do in terms of ticking off the list for my PhD, I might use it for good rather than evil. Uh, so the benefit of taking part in the three minute thesis um, comes from a number of places. One of those really is to press pause and to stop and think, you know what, I've been so immersed in this study for so long but I'm not exactly sure what it is that I'm finding out and what it is that I might um, indicate to others. You know, we get an opportunity in our confirmation of candidature to provide a little snapshot about why we're doing the study, what the literature tells us and what we might find out. And I think taking part in the three minute thesis, irrespective of where, you're, where you are in that journey, allows you to think about all of those things that you were given the opportunity to reflect on right at the beginning. It also gives you an opportunity to step outside yourself. Um, in a, uh, I went, I was presenting, I think not last year, but the year before at the International Qualitative Research Methods Conference. And one of the keynote speakers there spoke about how we really need to support students as they move from PhD to the rest of their academic career. Because the interesting part of the PhD journey is that, that you work by yourself for so long. You know that you do have your supervisors there to be your cheer squad along the way. You have the friends that you make who are doing studies. You have your poor family that is so bored of listening to everything that you've been researching. But ultimately it all comes down to you. You're the person that sits there for long periods of time or as my friend Kath always says, the year of sitting dangerously in that um, write up phase. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, opportunities to just kind of be stuck in your own mind. So the three minute thesis allows you to step outside of yourself and not get too caught up in that academic process. 
it can be really challenging as you go along that academic journey of trying to write peer reviewed publications when you're a baby researcher because there's so much rejection, there's so much um, response from individuals saying this isn't done right. This is your opportunity to decide what it is that you've found out and how you're going to present that to others. It also allows you to visualise that spec. So that image that I've got up there about Dr Seuss and, um, and exploring you know, that little speck that sits on that clover. The three minute thesis is actually three minutes for you to stop and tell people what you found from peering in. And I think that that's incredibly important. And for those of us, um, particularly in a health setting, where you're interviewing participants for your study, it's a way of giving back to them, saying out aloud to other people, when I did this study, this is what I found from talking to people. And there, I think sometimes there's no better way of honouring our research participants than sharing what it is that they told us. So my PhD focused on the experience of hope for families of missing people. And I think that um, by being able to stand up and speak out loud about what those families decided to share with me was a really great opportunity for me to begin to give back other than embedding all of those thoughts within the actual thesis. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to the next slide? No, no. Okay, not a problem. All right, Cheryl, do your thing and <laughs> we'll jump ahead. Okay, so this is the actual mechanics of how I did it. Um, I haven't included a link here of both of the videos of my three minute thesis. So I actually got to do it in three stages. I'm not sure how the process works now, but the very first um, opportunity I had was um, presenting um, my three minute thesis. I actually did it via teleconference from the Parramatta campus um, to, uh, to Kim Usher and to MIF. And I think that there was someone else there on the day, but I can't exactly remember. Um, so I presented it there. And then I presented it at the broader UNE um, three minute thesis competition where all of the other schools and faculties um, who had a representative came together. So I presented it there, I flew up to Armadale. And then after I won the UNE competition, um, I then went to Perth to present it at the, it sounds very clever here, the Trans-Tasman finals of the three minute thesis that brought together Australia, New Zealand and some of the Asia Pacific countries, um, the representatives from individual universities to come together and present their three minute thesis. So that sounds kind of a little bit panic inducing, I think for many of us in the audience that are introverts. Um, but really, if I kept reminding myself why it was that I stood up and spoke, it, it was I was able to manage the nerves that I had on, on those days. So those, those were the three stages. So how do you actually prepare for the three minute thesis? And like all good social workers, I'm not gonna ask Miff, Miff to give out butcher's paper and we'll all start collaborating and talking. But I think it might be useful while I'm speaking here today, if we can have a little break between this slide and the next one, for you to talk to the person next to you and time what it feels like to talk for three minutes about where you're at with your study. Because I think if I had have had that practice along the way, I might have been able to manage the nerves in the lead up to um, those first, um, that initial stage of presenting my three minute thesis. Um, as I said before, I haven't got a link here, but you can just Google Sarah Wayland and three minute thesis and both the School of Health link and the link from the, um, the Perth based um, competition um, come up as well. The sound's not great. That's why I didn't want to present it here today. But if you're watching it at home and you've got nothing better to do, then have a look what's there. <laughs> so just in terms of some of those tips of writing up your talk. It's very much um, similar to when you're starting to think about writing a journal paper. You know, what element of your research do you want to talk about? How did you actually do your research? What have you found out from your research? And what's the final message that you want to leave with the audience? Most of the time, I didn't have a huge amount of time to prepare for that first talk. And I think that that was really useful to not overthink it a lot. Um, but I had a look online at other three minute theses and I chose the ones that were very different to mine. So I didn't just look at those with a health or a social work focus. I looked at people that were presenting information that I wouldn't necessarily be interested in. So some of those science based three minute thesis talks, 
um, or anything to do with quantitative data, which usually makes me fall asleep. Any of those I made sure I watched. And I wanted to see what it was in those talks that made it interesting enough for me to listen through to the end. So I needed to really work out, well, what were, what were the segments that I had to present? I wanted to make sure that when the audience heard me talk, when I finished talking, that they got a sense of exactly why I was doing the study and exactly what I had found out from it. And that's really different, uh, that's really difficult from a qualitative health perspective because sometimes our results or our learnings are not immediately clear. You know, we understand them, but trying to tell an audience that has had nothing to do with our study um, is really difficult and challenging to bring together. So probably the thing that helped me out the most with writing my talk is that my poor long suffering children, particularly my three girls who at that stage must have been like nine and 13 and 14, I practiced my talk and I made them listen. And then, <laughs> and there was a lot of eye rolling, but that was okay. I made them say back to me, what do you think my study was about when I got to the end? And I thought, when we talk about um, presenting to other audiences, sometimes we don't make it um, simple enough. We make it a little bit simple, but not enough for people to go, oh, I get what it is that you're talking about. So within my talk, I started off with a participant narrative. Um, my, my daughter, who's now 11, she still actually remembers my three minute thesis. And when I'm yelling at her to go to bed, she often says to me, I'll do your three minute thesis for you. So she actually still remembers what's in her mind about where I started and where I ended up. So I made sure that I started with a participant narrative. It was about trying to get the audience straight away. Um, sometimes I have a little bit of luck with my research topic because a lot of people are interested in the narratives of families of missing people. So I started off with that and then I went into the detail of what the actual research study was, but in very much layperson speak. So I spoke about how many participants I had, what I actually did. I didn't talk necessarily about a narrative inquiry framework. I talked about sitting with families of missing people and allowing them to tell their stories between hopefulness and hopelessness. I then made sure I incorporated some elements of my literature review without um, you know, referencing every single pe person I spoke about, but just a little bit of a background about, well, why is it that we want to study um, this particular population? And then nearer to the end, which was really useful for me nine months out for finishing my PhD, was that I tried to incorporate the results. I tried to think about, well, what were the ones that stood out for me in the analysis phase? Which were the stories that helped me shape the chapters that I, that I was writing? And then the so what at the end. Um, I finished off with a participant narrative because I felt that it was able to connect with the audience a little bit more because there's strength in telling the stories of others. And many of you would know that um, coming from a qualitative or a health focus. Um, just in terms of the practicalities of the day, um, in that very first time that I um, took part in the three minute thesis, I didn't know my talk off by heart. I had um, two um, palm cards that just had prompts about the beginning of each section. Um, and I knew it well enough to kind of wing it. My talk changed each time I did it. Um, but make sure that you know um, not only your talk well enough, but your study well enough to talk about. Make sure that you understand, you know, if you had an opportunity to catch someone who would really benefit from hearing about your study, make sure you know it well enough to present it well enough. I think what sits at the core is, um, is having a team behind you. Um, I was incredibly lucky to have someone like Miff as my supervisor because I was able to say to her, these are the things that I'm thinking about does that resonate with you in terms of what you think my study is about? Because we might know it well enough in our own heads, but unless we say it to other people, we're not going to have that reflected back to us. And that was useful following on from the three minute thesis in the write up stage. I kept remembering the points where um, I'd think, oh, I'll include that line or I'll talk about that concept. But if other people like Miff or like my family or like my other PhD friends, if they said to me, actually, I don't understand what you meant by that line, then that was a really good indicator for me about how I might actually finish writing the thesis as well. And even extending on to the publications that I'm still trying to push out from the thesis, 
about making sure that I understood really clearly um, what it was that I was trying to say, rather than kind of saying it and hoping that people got it, which is my usual style sometimes. I kind of make it up until I completely know it. And I think that that's okay too. Um, I think that the three minute thesis is a bit of a snapshot, exactly like the confirmation of candidature is. It, it tells a story of place and time. Um, so you don't have to worry about where you're at in the process. You just have to be able to tell the story appropriately about where you're at in that, in that moment in time. So before I go on to talk about the unexpected opportunities that have come for me um, from doing the three minute thesis, what I thought maybe we could do, and even the people in the audience who aren't doing their PhDs or thinking that they're not at a stage to be involved, I just want you to feel what it's like to talk for three, for three minutes about what it is that you're doing. Because you'll notice that it falls, it, it's almost like you're trying to make sense of it as you talk. So if everyone can just use their phones and put a bit of a timer on for three minutes and just practice what it's like talking to the person next to you for three minutes about where you're at, just, <laughs> just as a bit of an exciting opportunity to say, you know what, it's not actually that long to talk for three minutes and it's a great opportunity for the School of Health to have more participants. So just do that for a few minutes and then we can come back. Okay, are we ready to come back together? I feel like I've stumbled upon a great teaching opportunity where I can just do it from home with my slippers on with my social work students at Sydney who just yawn a lot when I talk. So maybe I could just dial it in and offer it as a new opportunity. Okay, so it would be really great if we could hear from a couple of people about what it was like to talk for three minutes. It's okay if you did completely rubbish. It's okay if you stumbled. It's okay if you talked for 90 seconds and then thought, I have nothing else to say. What did um, what did people find? What was the experience like? It was longer than I thought, and it feels much much longer than three minutes. Okay, <laughs> that's not my desired outcome with getting you to do the exercise. <laughs> so I'll just pretend that that one didn't happen. Um, <laughs> anyone else? I realised I, I don't actually know anything about my research. Yes, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> No, that's a really great reflection because I know when I started, I wanted to go, I did stuff, I talked to people and I found out some stuff that was interesting. That was kind of my first draft of my three minute thesis. And so it's a good place to start from where you think, um, hang on, I thought I knew all of the, that, that so what factor of my study, but it does allow you to stop because we're so busy always working on the next milestone or the next thing that we have to achieve or making sure that we're working to our deadlines or how long we're supposed to take to do our thesis, um, that you don't actually get the luxury of stopping. And that was what I was trying to talk about today. Um, the, that, the comment that I will acknowledge now, because I'll, I'll be collaborative <laughs> about three, <laughs> three minutes felt quite a long time. There's, there was someone, um, I think I worked out, I had to do a, um, I'll stop and talk about one thought here rather than the five thoughts that are going through my head at the same time, that if you actually spoke your whole thesis, I think that you would talk for nine hours straight. I think that's what the stats say, that if you presented a 90,000 word thesis, spoken word, that you would talk nonstop for nine hours. So that was the way that I kind of got past the fear of three minutes because I thought, you know what, Miff could make me stand up and talk for nine hours or I could offer to talk for three minutes and the three minutes works better for me than it does around the other way. So sometimes you've got to work out, well, what's the benefits of condensing all of that information? I also think now that I'm in postdoc land that um, the grant writing process, it can be really benefited by the capacity to condense what it is that you've learnt and why it is that you need money to do something else. So there's lots of layers that go with being given the opportunity to stop and reflect and to present something different. Did anyone else have anything different that they found in talking for three minutes? What about you, Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I sat up the back. <laughs> I know, but I can see you up there. What did you think? <laughs> No, it was fine. I was actually um, a little bit hesitant to start. But once I got a roll on, I could just stop. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 45 seconds out. And I went, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
See, and, and I think that that's a reminder that it doesn't matter where you are in the process. Your three minute thesis could be about your literature review and the learnings that you had from that or getting ethics or negotiating with trying to recruit participants. You know, there's all there's all of those different layers within the PhD process. It doesn't have to be a snapshot of every single thing that you presented. And what I found when I went to Perth um, to present at the Trans-Tasman finals is that everyone was at different levels. There was one woman that I was with out the back um, who was only six months into the process and she was there to present about her literature review and what it meant for her to explore some ideas around mental health and creativity. So it was really useful to see that not everyone was just at that final falling over stage of trying to finish up the writing process, that everyone was at a different point. So it's really inclusive. So I, I guess that's probably one of the take home messages that I had for today as well. Um, so Cheryl, can you just jump forward to the next slide? And I'm just going to finish off with some thoughts about unexpected opportunities and, um, and just some take home messages. See how I've incorporated the elements of the three minute thesis into my talk today? <laughs> okay. So this is a little bit of a slide that I use sometimes when I'm trying to convince people, first of all, to do a PhD or to do the different elements of your PhD, is that there's lots of unexpected opportunities that come from stepping into the arena. So um, this is where I'm just going to talk about what it's meant for me. It will be different for everybody. Um, it will be different for um, people that you know, took part in that first round of um, doing the three minute thesis and didn't progress. There's lots of um, uh, outcomes and opportunities irrespective of how well you go. It's not about a competition and it's not about winning. For me, it was very much about the process because I've been able to use that three minute snapshot in a number of different ways since I finished my PhD. So um, for me, what I found, um, so when I finished, um, when I graduated, I actually started at University of Sydney about a week later as um, a postdoc research associate um, in the Centre for Disability Research and Policy. And then um, I started at UTS as a postdoc research fellow in November of last year. So I've been for two job interviews since I finished my PhD. And at both job interviews, they focus very much on, oh, you took part in the three minute thesis competition. Tell us what your study was about. Now, that was kind of like trying to get your brain to work in a way because I had packed away the three minute thesis. And I stupidly at the UTS interview said, oh, yeah, yeah, I completely remember it. I'll tell it to you now. <laughs> and I tried to tell them and then I forgot halfway through what the rest of it was. So I just tried to make that up. But the point I'm trying to make is that it was useful for um, uh, people on interview panels to see you attempting to translate your research to the broader community. And that's what the three minute thesis does. Um, it also allowed me to have a recording of what my three minute thesis was. I was able to send that to my participants to say to them, you know, this is the stage that I'm at with my PhD and this is what I found out. It was useful for them to be able to have that aha moment as well, to be able to see how it was that I was taking their narratives and analysing them and presenting them for the greater good. So for other families of missing people. And those clips that I've put on YouTube were then used by um, services internationally, so Missing Persons UK and some of the um, agencies in the States to present to their family groups. So it wasn't just about presenting to my School of Health colleagues or to UNE or at the finals, but it was about using that clip to present to others what it was that I was finding out. And we don't often get an opportunity to have that sort of information to put on our electronic resume. It also pushed me away from my desk. You know, I think that I was so exhausted and so over it in that final stage because I just existed between parenting and PhDing and sleeping. That was all that I did. So the minute I would take the kids to school, I would quickly rush home and sit down and work on things until, you know, 2.44 before I would run back up to school and get the kids. So it actually made me um, get back out in the world again. And I think that that's an occupational hazard that comes with doing a PhD. You get really immersed in what's inside the computer and you don't actually see all of the other stuff that's happening. So it was really validating for me at that stage. I needed a win. I needed something to be able to present some information together to work out why I'd actually done it in the first place. Um, it also resulted in some media 
Um, the Sydney Morning Herald did a profile on me. I did some media in Western Australia when I arrived at the Perth finals. Um, and also UNE profiled me. So that was really good for my academic profile at that stage. I was still um, trying to navigate my way through a PhD and I hadn't yet started to think about, well, what sort of job do I have after this? I'd kind of been focused on when the scholarship ran out and then trying to work out, you know, do we just exist on beans and toast after that in my family? So it was nice to um, start thinking about more broadly, how could I use this for my benefit um, for my longer career rather than just the end of the PhD. But I think most importantly, um, and it's, you know, I, I acknowledge all of the way through my thesis and in my three minute thesis, um, my gratitude to families for sharing their stories with me. But you know what, it reminded me why I did it in the first place. Um, and I think that um, the PhD can be a really hard journey. And, and so it's nice to actually go to have that nice feeling that comes from, oh yeah, I had this thought, this is how I thought I'd do it and this is how I saw it through. So it, it was kind of like a, a finishing off idea. So that was what came for me um, from, from taking part in the three minute thesis <laughs> challenge. Um, but I guess uh, in terms of final thoughts, and I don't know if anyone's got any questions, but I can leave some time at the end, is that I just um, would encourage you to do it, not because um, the School of Health asks you to do it, and maybe that's not the right thing to say, but do it for yourself. Um, do it as an opportunity to practice a different skill set. You know, as academics, we're often just sitting and writing or talking. Um, there's not an opportunity to, to put a little bit of um, niceness back in, into our own emotional health bucket. And I think the three minute thesis allows us to do that. So it doesn't matter what your topic is. It doesn't have to be one that connects with the community because it's a lovely story or it's a traumatic story or it's going to be earth shattering in terms of the, the recommendations that you've made. But it's just about sharing the process of learning which I think that's, that's the whole role of being a researcher is your curiosity about identifying something, working on it and coming up with some solutions and giving back. So the three minute thesis allows you to give back. Um, I think that we should sing our achievements more than what we actually do. Um, and I think representing the School of Health by talking about the great things that we all do, the different things that we all do the diversity of what our research um, outcomes are means that um, it enhances our own pro profile and the School of Health's profile at the same time. So even though it was a tiring process to be part of, um, it, it's something that has continually cropped up time and time again as I try and navigate, um, you know, the sometimes precarious employment conditions of being an academic. So um, it can actually work in your favour. And it, it might not be that it opens a hundred doors for you, but at least reminds you why you even bothered in the first place. So I think that that's where I'd like to leave it, but I'm happy to either answer questions here, or if you've got some questions about the mechanics of, you know, how you put a talk together or what I found um, refining my talk over time, then I'm happy for people to email me. Um, uh, I think that Cheryl will share my email address if people need to connect with me, but if not, um, thank you for listening and thank you for um, being brave and um, practicing for three minutes. Um, you can keep trying it when you get home if you've got nothing else to do. So, <laughs> thank you. No, no, I've I've got eight minutes. Eight minutes. Anybody want a question or comment or anything about? No, I think they're all a bit blown away. Sarah. <laughs> I'll just say, in terms of Sarah and um, doing the three minute thesis at the same time as two other PhD students out of that same tea and sympathy group where they used to whinge about me. <laughs> <laughs> actually, really good for all of them because they did all in very different ways. They presented it very differently, all of that. But it enabled all three of them to really distill their thoughts about what on earth are we doing? Yeah. And because all of them at that stage, between about nine and 12 months out, we're still in that are all this data and it's all interesting and it's all going somewhere and to be able to actually start narrowing it down to these are the key messages this is why this is important and it was a it, it actually was a really good time for all of them to get into it and even though 
you know, I mean, there's a competition, so only one person wins from here and one person wins from the next stage. Yeah. But it still gave them all that really good experience. So I would like Sarah, I'd encourage everybody to give it a go. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in your in your progress through no. or through your research career, because you know, you don't know when you're gonna find yourself in an elevator with someone who's got money. Um, yes. and they say, What is it you research? And you need, you know, you've got the queen for one and twenty to tell them. Yeah. Um, so you need to be able to say it quick, fast, what the take home message is. Um, so it's a, it is a really, really good process and it certainly helped all three of them, um, even though Sarah was obviously the one to go on um, from the UNA, it was a really good experience for all of them. It was Actually, Sarah, yeah. Oh, sorry, but I was just going to say the thing that I got out of your talk was that it could be at any stage of the. I, I think students think that they have to be almost finished to do yes. it. Yes. Anything about their topic that you want to present to people. Yes. Yeah. Is... And the diversity that was particularly um, at the Trans Tasman finals is that there were so many people all at different levels, all studying different things, all with different take home <laughs> messages. And it was, it was, um, I, part of the challenge of being a presenter there on the day was you didn't actually get to sit in the audience for long periods of time and hear what people were presenting. Um, but the woman that won uh, in the year that I was there talked about what she understood from studying dolphins and the way that they communicate with each other. And it was, it was just one of those moments where you didn't have to have any prior knowledge about what it was that she was studying. It was just that what she was presenting was incredibly interesting. And I think that that's the key point too. So it doesn't matter where you are or what you're talking about. It's about demonstrating to the audience. I was curious about this and this is what I'm starting to work out. It's kind of like I always say to students before they submit their essays, read it out aloud. And if it doesn't make sense when you're talking it, then it's not going to make sense to me when I'm reading it. So it, it, it actually forces you to stand up and step away from the computer and think about what it is that you've learned. Um, and Sarah, the other thing I got from your talk and from Anthea's was the, the notion that you both had support groups of other PhD students or other um, yes. research students that you connected with personally and socially as well to, to keep you going. It's always good to do that. Isn't it? it does, yeah. it does. And, um, and I should also acknowledge that um, Dr. Gina Dillon was part of that group of four. And, uh, and I think, um, and sadly with her passing away this year, it's been a really important reminder of how important those relationships are. And I won't talk too much about that because it's all still a little bit new, um, but about how important those relationships are and for all of us to be able to practice with each other and tell each other what we've learnt meant that it was a little less uh, of a lonely process. So any more comments for Sarah? Uh, Sarah, I'd really like to thank you very much for giving up your time and sharing your um, experience with us. We have a little gift for you, but I'm going to have to put it in the mail. I've got you coming up. But um, uh, once again, I really appreciate. We think we might, uh, once we log off to you uh, from you, is show your um, presentation. Cheryl's got the link there, so we'll put it up. Great. But thank you very much, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.